Welcome back, guys. That was quite a game. One coming out of Robert Morris and Johns Hopkins. So at the end of the day, Johns Hopkins did pick up game one. Now turning over to game two return. You gotta ask yourselves, do you think that Johns Hopkins have what it takes to be able to take this one? I think they've shown they have what it takes. I mean, they've made it all the way here, even beating out UBC in week number one of the playoffs. So it's definitely not above them, but after game number one, they've got to do something to shut down the playmaking squad that is RMU. All game long, it just felt like they never had an answer. Yeah, even at the beginning of the game, it just seemed like a lot of the lanes weren't going for Johns Hopkins, and they were always on the back foot, always trying to react to the plays being made by Robert Morris. So this time around, do you want it, what do you want to see change coming in from Johns Hopkins? They need to find a little bit of early game priority here, and that starts in the draft. They need to find some lane they're comfortable playing around, because, I mean, top lane, they drafted a losing matchup, Gangplank into just anyone. They blind picked it. Uh, and then they picked the Ezreal plus uh, the Ezreal plus Braum into a Kaisa matchup. So they never really put themselves in a spot to win any lane. I want to see them give somebody the ball, and they start running with it. Well, we're already getting into the pick and bands, and not too much of a surprise, Fizz. Has been taken away from Slycat. Yeah. Definitely was dominating on that. Minecraft Kids Vladimir had no way back into the game after that first blood went over to Piz. No, I mean, especially when you go that aggressive with the Malzahar build, normally you see the Spellbook plus the uh, eventual change to Teleport. Instead, he went with Electrocute Ignite. He needed to make something happen at level 1 or level 3. Ended up dying at level 3 and then never got back on the map. So, yeah. They, they just didn't have an answer for that. They're saying, you know what? Get rid of that fizz. Robert Morris keeping their bands the exact same as before. Nami and Kha'Zix have been banned away by them. Not going to give Kerrigan or Alert any way to play some of their more comfort bands. Uh, comfort picks. Well, the bands have really changed up coming in from Johns Hopkins. Saying, you know, we saw it before. We don't want to play against that again. So I'm making you play a very judge. different composition. Yeah, and so far, they're literally just banning out line for line, except for the Morgana. Every single champion that gave them an issue. Cloak, very big in the top lane, was able to hold on for a damn long time against the Gangplank uh, from the John Hopkins squad, and same thing with the Fizz, but now that the Zaya already being picked up, Rakan is still on the table, so this might actually be enough to make uh, Robert Moore's blind pick the Rakan, which still, it's not a very optimal play when Zaya's already on the other side, but... Uh, good move from John Hopkins, and that might get them a little bit more aggressive of a lane. Well, the thing about Rakan is he did get a couple buffs for when he's not with Zaya. He is a little bit stronger than he was before where he had to play with Zaya or he was completely worthless. But now, he has some more mobility, but I'm not too surprised to see Trundle being the first lock-in. Because Shockwave on that did a very great job forcing Kirigan to have to really react to him. And the Pillars can deny Skarner Olaf also. Very strong predator jungler. So much ways and tools to get into the back line. Yeah, and it looks like they will be, in fact, giving over the Zyra Khan if John Hopkins do want to execute on that. And, I mean, I was saying they needed some lane that they want to win. Zyra Khan is a absolutely fantastic way to get that going on across. But I do still have stuff like the Karma. We're going to reband away, so that's definitely a plus. But Karma, Zyra, they're still on the board. They're still available for Army to really find a contestable, aggressive lane here. Uh, and they will once again lock in that gangplank for the top side of the map. So seems like basically a little bit of a repeat of a game at number one, but this time with a bit more aggressive on the bot side. You don't even need to worry about the Swain either to go against this gangplank early. That almost makes me wonder if we're going to see Nova Cloak bust out the Aurelia now. Ooh. Aurelia does pretty well into gangplank notoriously. Okay. Vladimir is going to be picked up again for Minecraft, kid. This is a lot of priority put on the Gangplank, and I'm not entirely sure if I agree with it. Um, mostly because they don't actually pick up the Rakan here. Maybe they weren't even planning on playing it in the first place. Uh, but you got... Oh, okay. Maybe actually they might light it, let it through. Uh, just because the Thresh into Rakan is an incredibly good matchup for the Thresh side. But either way, they could just ban away the Rakan to say, you know what? You don't even get the... Lovers duo synergy, but uh, either way, still an incredibly aggressive bot lane for RMU. They're gonna, they're not gonna let this bot lane go without a fight. Not at all. But I do gotta ask, if not the Rakan, what would you pair with the Zaya to try to win out the bot lane? Caitlyn and Thresh. 
The Karma is definitely what springs to mind. If they want to go more defensive, certainly the Brahm's available, but at that point, you're not really looking to win the lane. You're just looking to be the two-item carry that uh, Zaya is. And if you want to go crazy, there's still even the Lulu uh, available if you want to just go for hyper two-item carry. Definitely a little bit less conventional, but I mean, speaking of conventional, if that Yasuo gets locked in, we can throw that word out the window. Well, you want conventional as well, Riven being covered, but no. Oh! New York, so... Okay. It seems that Robert Morris have gone, I see your split push, and I raise you someone who literally only ever wants to split push. And this is actually an incredibly good counter into the Gangplank, because there's one form of CC you cannot cleanse out of with your... Well, actually, there's multiple forms, but the one form York brings is that trap. It's the prison. It's the W going down. Gangplank, he has to auto-attack his way out of that, or Flash. That means top lane ganks between Trundle and Yorick are going to be so incredibly effective that they can just look to roll over that top lane and set up Yorick for an absolutely phenomenal split-pushing match. Yeah, but I do like this pickup. Jax coming in for Kirigan. Glad to not see the Predator-type junglers, especially into Trundle. You can deny them a easy way into the fight. Jax can simply jump over those and say, this is no big deal at all for me. I don't have to worry about it. The last pick of, of Rise into Vladimir. Not gonna, I don't expect at least this to be the kind of lane where Slycat's gonna be able to get an early solo kill over Vladimir. No, it's still gonna be incredibly difficult. The What the Rise does, it gives a lot more in terms of just split pushing pressure, and it also gives a lot more just in terms of early game pushing power as well, especially if you take the early mini dematerializer. You're going to be able to go neck and neck with Vladimir. Once again, don't expect Minecraft Kid to uh, go down as hard as he did last game, but it definitely been shocking seeing him back on the Vladimir after the last matchup. Maybe they're just like, all right, the, the, the Fizz was the only bad matchup. Everything else will be perfect. We'll just go back on and wreck face. Also would like to see a change-up of key, the Keystone Rune. Don't really want to see that Electric Cube back on Vladimir. Yeah. Unsealed Spellbook makes a lot more spe sense, especially when you draft Gangplank, get the 1-3-1 setup, because you can easily switch that Ignite out for Ghost. Yeah, these could be two 1-3-1 one, one split pushing compositions against each other. Uh, this is definitely going to be the Ignite locked in for Minecraft Kid. Unsure of the runes until we actually hit the loading screen, so we will keep you up to date on that one, but... You're completely right. I think Electrocute, it does get the job done in the early game, but it's so reliant around getting that early game pressure. That being said, though, Rise, much easier to gank than something like the Fizz, especially if you're an Alistar or a Jack. so maybe they're really just going to focus in on getting Minecraft Kid ahead in this early game. So is that the gameplay for John Topkins? Help out Minecraft Kid. Yeah. They, that's it. That's, that's it. it. Game game over. <laughs> game over? What about, what about win rate? I got to talk about him again because there's so much priority put on robert by robert morse on the win rate in the game one where i mean truly it didn't mean the most in the world they got him down to zero four and he still was doing damage still out dueling anybody that came near him mm -hmm. but this game with york york is great at dueling someone who wants to be in that situation such as gangplank yeah, and that, that's where you have to wonder what John Hopkins' overall game plan is going to be. Because you can very well assume that if you leave that game plank up there alone, he is going to be repeatedly ganked by Trundle plus Yorick. It's just the easiest lane for him to go to, and it's the most effective. Yorick basically being the direct counter right now to a game plank. So it would be a lot for Kerrigan to basically sit on this top side would definitely help out if the bot lane from John Hopkins was fine with keeping average Zaya in a 2v1 matchup for the duration of the match, letting out one, two, three alert on the all-star roam around, maybe help out mid lane, freeing up Kerrigan to move up to top lane. But either way, it's a lot of full map rotations coming from John Hopkins that need to happen. In last game, John Hopkins basically never left their lane before the 10 minute mark, whereas RMU were all over the map. So John Hopkins need to find a way to cancel out some of these key pressure points around the map without sacrificing that much. Yeah, especially with Alistar, I think you're quite on the money with that. You want to go for the early boots of mobility, try to rotate around, help out these other lanes. But there's still something that's nagging on my mind. In game one, we saw both teams grouping up into the jungle, trying to go for an early play, an early invade, but they didn't meet up. Could that happen this game? Is there more likelihood that Johns Hopkins wants to get this, or if even RMU try to go for the play themselves? 
in the at the level one, um, big thing is there's no Morgana, nothing like that, no, uh, no hard lockdown CC. Sure, you have Alistar. Sure, you do have Jax, but none of them are really able to lock down from level one, and even the Rise stun, it's a little bit low. Army you probably have the better chance at a level one invade if they want to go for something a little bit cheesier. They've got the Thresh, they've got the Rise, they've got the Trundle, things that can all lock down from level one. That being said, though, I think the fan, especially for John Hopkins, who don't really have much left uh, before they just get knocked out of the tournament entirely, they need to play this one a little bit more safe, a little bit more standard, and really try to use that early to mid-game map rotations to get this early game. And unfortunately, if you go for an invade, fail something, lose some flashes, especially on the support, that early game just out the window already. So exactly. it's going to be more important that they hold on to everything that they can. So before we get into this game, got to do a couple plugs really quick. Type in exclamation point Discord if you want to join our Discord community. Talk about all things collegiate with myself, all the other casters, Fekes, Fraterin, Corvus. I all love talking to people about that. Or you could reach out to us on Twitter at CSTAR League or CSL LOL if you want everything related to League of Legends collegiate esports. Yeah, and magical. What? Magical. I've what? been having an issue in Fortnite where I'm playing on my controller. It oh, keeps dying on me. What can someone like me do to help out? Um, you can quit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what you can do is you can go over to Juice Battery because they got the rechargeable batteries for your controllers. Make sure to go to their website, www.juicebattery.com, in order to check them out. I heard their batteries last six times longer than all of the other rechargeable ones, so make sure to give them some love. So we've gotten into Game 2 between Robert Morris University and Johns Hopkins, and look who's gained up. The Flash is coming in. They get the Flash out of Alistar. Yeah, and that flash out of All-Star is incredibly crucial in this early game. We were talking about before how John Hopkins needs to use 1-2-3 alerts. Rotations around the map keep going, but flash no flash! In. That was the double knockout, but is it going to be enough? That sentence is about to come off of cooldown. They want to see if they can pick up the kill still on the alert. Finally, the hook lands on to Kerrigan with the flash over the wall. Ignite on his head. So much burned by both teams, but nothing has been gained. Yeah, we're going to have to take stock after all of that crazy commotion off that level number one. Nobody actually falls in the end. Uh, looks like basically two flashes gone on the side. On the blue two side, rather, for John Hopkins. But two for two in the terms of flashes, flashes. both jungler and supports. But the only I, I'd say the biggest win is the fact that Ignite is already down off of Sonata. That does give a lot more level two pressure. Back towards John Hopkins' bot lane of average, Zaya plus 1, 2, 3 alert. Even without a flash, 1, 2, 3 alert is going to have an incredibly aggressive level 1. Especially with Synodic not taking Flay in the early game. Flay gives you the bonus auto attack damage. It gives you the disengage off of an Alistar engage. And now that means if Alistar plus Zaya get that first level 2, the engage is basically going to be unstoppable. And a lot of pressure and a lot of respect is going to have to be given. Especially with the leash being given by the bot lane towards Shockwave with Kiergan soloing it out of the blue buff all by and lonesome. This bot lane's actually in favor of Johns Hopkins. Even the top lane's not in too bad of a shape for win rate. Yeah, right now, but check out the bottom lane. Shockwave is already down here. He knows 1, 2, 3 alert does not have flash. Level 2. I'm trying to see if they can go in on to alert. It's going to be the pillar. That sentence does connect. They're trying to go in right into the hook. The headshot's connecting on to alert. Play back into the trap for first blood for AK-47 Leopard. Yeah, Shockwave, he takes a bit of a risk going for that early of a gank, but it pays off perfectly. No flash available on the 1, 2, 3 alert. I Means it's going to go around and over, and thankfully, they actually started opposite sides of the jungle, so Jax Kerrigan was on the top side. He's now on the bottom side. But since Shockwave took so long to get that gank off, there's no time for Kerrigan to react to that gank to go for the invade. So all of the buffs uh, coming out for this red side jungle of army are going to be taken away. And it looks like Kerrigan's also not going to be able to respond to bot lane with a gank as well. So all around, great play for Armyu. Would have been a 2v2 potential. I don't think that they were quite as confident in their play that they could have easily turned it around. Shockwave, okay. I was looking at him like, please don't die to the red buff. I don't want to have to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, would be most unfortunate, but it does seem to be going pretty safe. Also, speaking of safe, Minecraft Kid finally going with the spellbook. I'm glad to hear that, but at the same time, not seeming to help him out too much in this mid lane. 
being bullied around pretty heavily by Sly Camp constantly being shoved in, finds himself at a minor VS disadvantage towards Rise. So all in all, a lot of these lanes that we were kind of questioning, thinking that they'd be even, going for Armu and more trade into this bot lane. Ignite can drop onto Leopard a little bit early from Alert. Yeah, they're just looking for play after play alert. Tries to use, unfortunately, the defensive ignite. Doesn't get too much out of it. Uh, but what I just realized is check out the two minion demons he has that's currently coming out from Robert Morris. One for Sly Cat in the mid lane. Definitely no shocker there, but AK-47 taking one as well. Certainly not what you normally see out of something like a Caitlyn, but, I mean, heck, he had a lot of wave there before. He's going to have even more now. It's funny. I was going to mention that. I was... Looking at that, I saw that as well. Ooh. Nice, nice disengage coming in from Leopard and Synodic. But anyways, I was going I was gonna mention the minion dematerializer on Caitlyn. What are like real benefits to having that for her instead of going for maybe a I'd say a little bit more damage oriented in the rooms. But the good thing with this is it's going to make sure AK-47 is always pushing in. And as a roaming support, it is incredibly hard to leave the lane when your ADC is stuck under tower, especially against someone like a Caitlyn plus a Thresh. There's too much of a risk of him getting dived 2v1 or even, God forbid, a Shockwave comes down 3v1. So it keeps Alert stuck in the bottom lane, which means mid lane's not going to get any help. It means the only person who could come to top lane is Kerrigan. But check this out. Yeah, Potential top lane dive problem. in the works. We're trying to see if they can get level 6. Did the eulogy have Queen down on the map so that she can start taking a little bit of the damage from the tower? But it does seem that... Playing the long play. con. What? He realized that it was a little bit too much of a long con. So he's trying to see if he can steal away the Gromp. They are even in levels between the two junglers. Unfortunately, it does seem that Shockwave was not able to finally get that tower dive. Yeah, but it is always best to see a play, think it's not going to work, and just call it off entirely. Then see a play, think about it for five seconds, go for it, both of you die, game over. Or at least disadvantage, so uh, arm you. Wasting a little bit of time, but still making sure that they are firmly in control of this matchup. But now, moving towards the bottom lane, because like at once again, knew that Kerrigan was in the top lane. This will mean three members on the bot side of the map once more. Both Flash is still available. Like that's gonna have to be a little bit careful in the mid lane. He's running away, but look at the double root coming in from Average Zaya. Knocked back from Alert, but headshot after headshot had to flash away. No ult just yet. Realm Rise. coming down. Like that is behind. They've caught out Average Zaya. She wants to go for the full aggression, but ignite onto her head. Alert dies in the back line as finally the pilt over Peacemaker gets the kill and top lane. Nova gets himself one as well. It's gonna be three kills across the map in favor of RMU. It hurts losing that bot lane play, but what hurts even more is while all that's happening, top lane dies as well, and that could be just the straw that breaks the camel's back, at least mentally on this play. Because RMU, they have taken complete control of this early game so far. See, we didn't even get to talk about that beautiful disengage from Shockwave right there. Kierkegaard had the counter strike all ready to go. He was ready to leap strike into the battle. The pillar disrupted Kerrigan while he was mid-flight. You know, that was just really well played. And so far, RMU seem to be very on top of the disengages, whether it's Shockwave throwing down a great trundle pillar to deny the Kerrigan engage, or whether it's Synodic throwing out that lantern, holding Leopard, uh, Leopard back away from an Alistar engage. So uh, certainly they're playing pretty darn well this matchup, even cleaner than match number one. And John Hopkins, they picked for the early game. They still have some late game scaling elements, but it's just not looking as convincing in this match. Not at all. I'm looking over to the build. Three daggers sitting in the inventory for AK-47. Including that BF sword, he is well above and ahead. Average Zaya has two kills as well. Yeah, look at this also. The eight minute cull coming out for Average Zaya. Certainly not something we see very often here. The spikes for Zaya are a little bit unique compared to other ADCs in the meta just because you only need to get really two items, so the Essence Weaver plus the Zeal item, before you're comfortable with team fighting just because of the attack speed you get off of your W. You can just spike a little bit earlier while Caitlyn's still in her trough, but the Cola is going to slow that down for the time being. Once she gets to 154 CS, it's going to help her accelerate quite a bit, and that's really when 
John Hopkins need to start popping off, but that means for the next five minutes of the match, they have to be so incredibly safe. Top lane win rate getting attacked once again by Nova. The damage coming in as the shovel keeps wailing onto his head. It's absurd. This top lane is going so heavily in favor of the Zorik. You only has the Sheen with the Merc Tread, so not really that many items in his favor, but just the damage that he's busting out on Gangplank and taking over the top side. It's not often you get the pleasure of seeing a Yorick up against the Gangplank in the top lane, but when it does come out, it nearly always works to perfection because you are so good at punishing the low damage of win rate in the early game. You're so good at coordinating those ganks, especially that Shockwave does have the pillar. You can use a pillar to lock him in uh, the prison from Yorick. And just like that, you've got yourself a nice and spicy gang playing sandwich right in front of you, all hot and ready to go. But now, four man rotation down to the bot side of the map. Looking for that first tower of the game. Realm Morph is there for Sly Cat, but he was spotted out by a ward. Map side is going to back off pretty fast, but look at top side. Here comes the uh, Maiden of the Mist to try to see if he can help out Nova, but he's being chunked out pretty heavily. No way to fight back on that one. Thankfully, the team across the rift takes the first brick gold and continues the push into the tier 2 and bot. Yeah, John Hopkins are able to find something back on that play, but Rob Remorse showed no signs of letting up. This is a 4v3 on the bottom portion of the map. Hook lands. Hook lands, coming in for the flank of Shockwave. They already took out Alistar so quick. Subjugate on to Aphrodite, even with the Feather Storm. It's not enough to help you out. You might have traded the kill, so it is a double kill at the end of the day from the Hemo Plague. Still, a lot of damage has been traded back and forth, and the reactionary play of Johns Hopkins find themselves in a little bit of a wonky situation where they got to try to figure out what they want across the map. Minecraft Kid getting two kills off the back end of that play is incredibly crucial because John Hopkins now have a member who's starting to scale up to potentially be that answer to AK-47 and Slycat going on to later in this game. But the problem is it's just the tools they're putting together. The tools mean nothing if you're not able to follow through with the play. And right now, looking at just their confidence, how they've been playing this entire series, they're still on that back foot, both in the gold lead, in the pressure lead, and even in the mentality lead. They need to start picking up the pace. However, look at top side Kierkegaard there is once again looking to see if he can make another play on a 2v1. Nova. Nova's got a lot of damage back on the win rate. No cannon barrage this time around, but the damage is there from Kierkegaard. going to lock them inside of the wall torment, but it does not help. Yeah, while Yorick may still be the direct counter to Gangplank, it doesn't matter too much when you do have the 2v1, so... Uh, good mindfulness coming out of Kerrigan, not only now getting a Minecraft Kid ahead, but also getting some more much-needed gold into win rate. The two scaling elements for John Hopkins, the same win condition could potentially be on the board. But this could also be the duo taking the top lane tower. What's the response from RMU going to be in the mid lane? RMU were able to take the first strike of the game, got the ocean under their belt. Trying to see if they can siege down mid lane. The one thing about having Bryce and Caitlyn on the same team is they got really great wave clear. This tower looks like it's the objective from RMU. Look how quickly they do damage to this tower. Yeah, and once again, with the siege potential out of Caitlyn with Slycat getting off to a fairly good early game, still maybe not quite there yet when it comes to uh, mid game scaling. And Average Zaya, once again, with the coal and a Caulfield Warhammer as her item set right now. You're just so not able to contest. That is just not in the playbook. It's not an option. Don't even think about it. If we thought that they were waiting for the late game before, that's even more of a statement. They have to wait for the late game. But a lot of damage Ooh. on a shot base. Subjugate will keep them alive. Even with the can of barrage gone. Not too much has been lost just yet by RMU. They hold on to dear life. Keep themselves alive and keep themselves with the gold lead. And already, they are starting to set up for RMU in that 1-3-1 with Yorick in the oh, top lane. And it's like in the molly, but we've seen this one before, too. This has happened time and time again. Level advantage. Well, Torment does luck in cure again. This time around, Nova, with Flash under his belt, is able to get out of dodge. His team looking to keep pushing in these other lanes, especially with how much focus has been put onto this Yorick. And with surprise, we haven't seen them try to swap him up, put him in the bot lane. Yeah, shocking to see that for now, but all the time, TP still remaining in the bot lane with Slycat and win rate, though, in the top lane. But Slycat's trying to pull people away because that Rift Herald is up and on the board. Three, two members, though, on the top side of the map for John Hopkins. 
They could look for that tower pretty easily if they wanted to. Exactly. And this is where, for the side of John Hopkins, they gotta decide what they want. Do they think that they can take down this tower in the bot lane pretty quick? And if so, are they willing to sacrifice that in a trade for this top lane? For army, you can easily take that if they rotate Leopard, rotate Slycat and Sonotic into that lane. I have to see exactly how they do want to allocate a lot of options available for RMU. But a big thing last match was RMU were very slow transitioning from the T2s all the way to the inhibitor towers. And still, there is one more tower up in the top lane available for the taking on the back of the RMU side. That uh, being said, though, they've still got a pretty strong sailing competition with both the Rise and the Caitlyn looking for those later game points. And Nova Cloak is still going to be a monster on the split push. Yorick. You never really get past the split push, Yorick. Uh, but all things considered, Army do eventually have to end this game. If you give enough time for both Winrate and Minecraft Kid to come online, you're not going to be having a fun time. The question is, where do you find that big advantage? Because Army for last match, found it off the back of a not quite lucky Baron, but a very poorly timed backs coming out of John Hopkins, which opened up a frankly free Baron. Is that going to happen again? Because if it doesn't happen again, if Army didn't get that last Baron, I'm not convinced they would have ended that game in that timely of a manner. Looking over to the items is really where, to me, it signifies how we're going to see these two teams playing, whether or not Army are going to be able to end. The call, I mean, we got to keep calling it out from yeah. Average Zaya. When you grab that into a Caitlyn match, when you grab that seven minutes into the game, pretty much sacrificing the next 20 minutes of the game because you got it so late. You know yep. you're not going to be able to get a lot of pressure. You're down three kills to Caitlyn. And for the side of yep. RMU, they just got to look for these fights. Like everything in this game, that Cole once again is a gamble, but... Sonic. Not getting jumped on. Did have flash, trying to re-engage the pull onto alert. Shockwave was there. Seems that RMU playing this one a little bit more passively, just trying to get more gold, trying to keep stocking that up as they look for the siege on this tier one and top. Yeah, so far, so good coming out of the RMU kids. But continuing to go back to that Cole, the Cole, like everything in this game, is a gamble. It's saying that I'm going to give up my item for the next 15 minutes, but when that 15 minutes is up, I'm going to get a good spike. And right now, it's not been that bad of a wager. They haven't lost that dreadfully much. In fact, they might look for the ADC. Leopard will they use the 90 caliber net to get out away from Kyrgyz. No Counter-Strike on a land today. The biggest thing is that all this time, Shockwave has been onto the Rift Herald trying to see if he can take that down solo. Because Leopard felt that he was forced out of the lane, easily rotates, helps take that down for the team. The rest of RMU making the pings. They want to go down mid lane. With they have the inside track on it. For the gank on Nova Cloak. Maybe not necessarily the person you want to go for. Drift Herald's already there. Here comes the Maiden of the Mist. Win rate will help to secure the kill on a Nova Cloak. But looking mid. Here to siege down by RMU. The gold. And go right into their pocket. And once again, they trade away Nova Cloak in order to get something else on the map. That gives you more advantage right now, but that definitely hurts your later game slip pushing from Nova Cloak because that is now the third time he has died in one of those off lanes. And that's still giving more and more gold over towards the gangplank. If you want to look at the bright side of the rainbow, technically, yes, Nova Cloak is being diminished in gold, gold value. You're not getting as much from getting him. And eventually, he will even be worth less than a cannon minion itself. So you could just kind of leave him out for bait. But that being said, you do now have to worry more about RMU sticking together as a big five-man squad instead of having the big split push game because split pushes are starting to fall behind. Well, even then, for me, I just look over to Nova Cloak and how much priority has been put on them by John Hopkins. He's been an afterthought. He's... Exactly, it's just more, they're putting this thought process in them. Winrate hasn't been able to do too much, even though he's got three kills over Nova Cloak, he always needs help, and then the rest of RMU are able to pick up these things, such as Kerrigan, they look for the pick, this TP. is the full engage coming in with TP behind, but they're already going to lose Shockwave before the fight even finishes, Minecraft Kid zones away Sonata, zones away Slycat, there's no way to get into them, Realm Warp is used just to get away from the fight. And once again, RMU are unable to set for the fight should they have good leads on AK-47, but mispositioning at the start of that one does eventually cost them a shockwave that could actually cost them the mid lane as well. Here comes the engage. Oh, great 
CC lock on to Leopard, but it's not enough to keep him in place. Kierigan was taking the tower for a little bit too long. Nova Cloak onto the A lot of flashes. Well. Flashes burned up left and right. The tower is finally what's going to fall. Tier 1 taken by Johns Hopkins. And definitely a little bit now. Uh, more resetting coming through, but this has to be a very worrying trade from RMU. They are now down in the gold lead, albeit probably about 50 gold behind. But even so, they're starting to really fall off. Nova Cloak, in particular, 8.6 to 6.4. And just look down at that ADC position. Average Zaya, still certainly a good portion behind. But he's almost done with that coal. He will be getting the gold value back out of that. That's not going to pick... That's not going to make up for absolutely everything. But it is going to help them come back a little by little. And win rate. Boy, this is the man you need to watch out in the top lane. If he can start turning some of these fights... Army might be forced into a game number three. Exactly, and this is where Gangplank starts coming online. He's able to really easily duel with most people that come into him. We also have to keep in mind, he's trying to duel into Nova Cloak on York. And York technically is never in a 1v1 scenario so long as the eulogy is off cooldown. Now that it is, win rate's got to be careful when trying to duel with York. That Herald has been hanging out for quite some time, so Nova Cloak will have a split pushing buddy on that bottom lane, but this is probably closing in on the last block of time arm you have a true advantage, especially through the ADC position. Before that Cole's done, before key items get completed, especially that Zonia's Hourglass for Minecraft Kid, but they find the jungler! They've gone to Kier again, that's the wall, the pillars fought it up with the jump back onto Leopard. It wasn't enough to pick up the kill, but they will trade it. Contra Synodic, win rate, into the fight. Bot lane still, the Rift Herald is being pushed with York. Slycat trying to do a little bit of damage to discourage the rest of the members of Johns Hopkins from trying to go into the battle. And with no cannon barrage up, it was used in that fight. This should be a tower taken down pretty easily. By yeah, Nova Cloak and the Rift one tower at least, he has the Eulogy, the Maiden of the Mist, himself and the herald he has so much flip pushing as the one man army yeah and look at this win rate had to walk that entire path just to get down to this lane they're the still going that's an inhibitor cracked open yeah that base is going to be cracked wide open by nova cloak and he wants to fight a little bit but finally with kerrigan coming back off of respawn he will survive getting the trade of the kills but that is a huge loss for johns hopkins yeah, RME though, not quite the fastest to respond. Would have loved to see them turn onto that Baron, but pushing out mid lane means that they're just gonna have to settle for the bot lane inhibitor tower plus the top lane T1 tower. That being said, 2k gold lead advantage is probably the last major advantage they will have before this Baron goes one way or another. And RMU, they have to put so much priority on this Baron because if they lose this Baron, that is handing John Hopkins the perfect amount of time they need to really scale back into this game. But keep in mind, Silver Turn, that was three towers taken down by RMU from that one play. True. I doubt that's ever going to happen again because John Hopkins, they've been pretty good at reacting towards these plays, but they gave up and forfeited so much potential gold to RMU. They had it even in gold. They were getting their lanes ahead. They have to be so cautious around this Baron because I doubt Nova Cloak's going to ever want to leave this bot lane to help out the team now that there's an exposed inhibitor. There should never be a time which Nova Cloak is being forced to the team if RMU want to walk away with this victory. They need to keep him on the split push, and that's going to be very difficult given that he has not had the best time on the split push game so far. Uh, that being said, the bot lane split push game is going to be so incredibly important leading up into this Baron, but check it out. Win rate doesn't have TP up just yet. He's only halfway there. Whereas Nova Cloak nearly is already completed uh, getting that TP timer back up. So Baron, certainly a possibility for RMU during these next few minutes if they were uh, smart enough to track the t teleport timers, of course. Uh, either way, though, there's still so much pressure they have to put up for because look at all the vision control for John Hopkins just around that Baron. Exactly. And I was going to say we have to keep in mind Kirkin was on the bottom side of the map. Nova Cloak very much not deterred by it. win rate. You spot out too many members going down to the bot lane from Johns Hopkins. RMU can easily turn their attention to try to take down this Baron like they did in game one. Yeah, so front, check out all those backs coming out from RMU. They need to be really careful right now because, I mean, Johns Hopkins, if they find that perfect opportunity, could turn a Baron right around on them. Exactly, but Jurgen wasn't in the best position to try to go onto this Baron. 
With all the members of RMU already racing out of the base, trying to get in position, trying to see if they can lay down some of this ward coverage so they can easily fight back. Catch the sentence just a little bit too late from Synodic to catch out Average Zaya. Nonetheless, both teams have stalled out a little bit. Trying to see if they can gain control of the map before they actually look for any risky play. Teleport coming in. Are they looking to contest this oh, this Windrake? I don't think that'd be the best move. They're that trying to get position. And the pick could be on to Kyrgyz. They oh. play him back, but don't land the death sentence. And it has just been burned. Oh! He's able to use that flash coming in from alert, but he didn't actually connect onto anyone too vital. Joffrey, gotta be careful. Subjugate to give him a little bit more help. Minecraft kid, front line. He was rooted up by the rune prison. Not connecting the death sentence once again. And Nova Cloak still in the bot lane. He is not deterred from his mission. He has one goal in life. That is to take down objective. Jump coming in from Shockwave. Has Ignite burning onto him. A lot of damage. Kerrigan finally finishes off the kill. For RMU, they got themselves a little bit more than they can chew. Still not deterred is Nova Cloak. Shockwave going in there was such a massive mistake, but at least they were able to trade it back and forth. And the trade back and forth onto alert as well. Still, this is York in the base. If RMU are smart, they're going to try to make sure no one can back. It's done. They're York to go into the base. They pick off Kerrigan, going for a little bit more. Win rate, he's running them down, taking down Psionic. He's got the shields from Sterk's gauge. Here comes a realm where is it going to be in time? Slide cat finally First Nexus falls. Tower. Next tower. Back to coming in. Nova Cloak realizes he can't go for it just yet. But is Leopard gonna be the hero? He stops the back of Gangplank. Here come the oranges, but is it okay? He gets traded down. It's the shutdown with the last Nexus Tower from Nova Cloak. He's got Sterk Kitch. Takes down both Nexus Towers. He will finally go down. He's gonna trade his own life as he gets CC'd and the killing spree for average Zaya. But Nova Cloak coming in clutch. That was so close. John Hawkins almost had to pack their bags and head on home for this entire tournament. Those were some pretty impactful kills. Now they do have the TP advantage. Hopefully they can keep win rate in the bottom lane against Yorick. But one small slip up now, especially against a double TP team. And boom, that game is over. No towers left defending that Nexus. John Hopkins are They're starting this. The They're starting it up. Nova Cloak's about to have TP coming up. If they lose this, they lose. So this is the play. Here comes TP in from Slycan. It's not even down to 25%, not even down to 50% just yet. TP in from win rate. This is going to be the tempted fight. This is five minutes of Johns Hopkins into the base. Nova Cloak's about to come up in one second, Engage. but they finished off Psionic pretty quickly into this fight. Returning onto the Baron. They continue the aggro, but the TP in from Nova Cloak. This they is Army. They have to stop the Vex. They have to make sure York can go to finish the game and they get the shutdown on the Minecraft Kid. Win rate. He wants to see if he can pick up anybody, but instead he will only get one shockwave is dead but nova cloak is in the base here comes zaya he will end. he be able to fight this he wants to see if he can Maybe. go for the end anyways he's still hitting on to the nexus one more two more the is flash he able to get the, game? the flash away they get it. It. that's gonna be the game from rmu what a way to go all the way to huntington beach rmu are you kidding me what is that that's how you play your kids you go one and five it does not matter Split push for days. Wow. Oh my god. You could have questioned me before this match. How do you think this game's gonna end? But that was absolutely insane. RMU, they see the opportunity and they pull the trigger. That play does not work if everyone on that team is not committed. That was one hell of a play coming out from everyone on RMU, cementing their trip to Huntington Beach to play for the JVCSL. Wow, That's that crazy. that is a well-earned victory, a well-earned celebration, hopefully, if I have ever seen one before. RMU, they're just on another level as far as macro goes. That was insane. That was absolutely insane. Johns Hopkins, they got to be looking at that game and thinking, you know, it was well played coming in from RMU. They did a hell of a job as well. Even though it was a 2-0, they fought tooth and nail in both of those games. Yeah, a very valiant effort. Unfortunately, not enough in the early game. Robert Morris, game one and game number two, ran away with the early games. Never had a response to it. And even though they were starting to really knock down that split push pressure from the top side of the map, that they were able to finally start controlling Nova Cloak, it just didn't matter because Nova Cloak won 5-0. and oh, He still was the one that ended the game. That's crazy. That's, Insane. That's, that's, how, that's how I'm going to say it. Just... 
That's good. That, that was insane. Crazy. Back door is successful from Nova Cloak. GG to RMU. But guys, with that, that's going to do it for me in return. I do believe we have some more games coming today. We, we have a lot of games today, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. As we still have to find out the other three teams that will be joining RMU at Huntington Beach. And also, we got week number one of the C Lowell uh, Collegiate Championship play-in stage. So much on the line in just one weekend. Now, I believe that now Robert Morris is going to play whoever wins between Houston and Illinois. We still have to wait for the to hear the results from that game. So hopefully we'll be able to find that all out. But guys, thank you for joining us here at Co Collegiate Star League. I've been Mad Magical. Joined in by return. I hope you guys have a wonderful night. We'll catch you later.